This is the Comics Alternative Manga, reviews of Red Colored Elegy and The Promised Neverland, Volume 1. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Manga. I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. And we're two comic scholars who absolutely love talking about manga. And on the February manga episode, Shay and I are going to discuss two recent publications, both of which are radically different, one from the other. We're going to begin with Seiichi Hayashi's Red Colored Elegy, the softcover edition. And then after that, we're going to look at the first volume of Keiyu Shirai and Pozuka Demizu's The Promised Neverland. But before we get into that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Manga is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes 50% off of the cover. But every now and again, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. Like this month, you can get volumes of Naoko Takauchi's Sailor Moon for 25% off. And you can get AX, this wonder, wonder, wonderful collection of alternative manga from a few years back, for 30% off. You really can't beat the prices at Discount Comic Book Service if for no other reason, because Discount is in their name. Go to (laughs) DCBService.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, manga and otherwise, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that Shay and Derek sent you. Well, Shay, before we get into a discussion of this month's titles, let us share with our listeners some correspondence that we have received over the past several weeks. Mail time! Mail time! Ooh, the mail's here! That means we get to see our old friend, Mailbox! <laughs> okay. We got a response from a David Wybenga on our YouTube channel, and this is regarding last month's episode where we looked at the the various Kataro books and also that Mangasia text from Paul Gravitt. And David writes, interesting, by the way, pronunciation is Kitaro. So there you go. You and I had been wondering how to pronounce Kitaro, 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 and according to David, it is Kitaro. So thanks for your clarification, David. I, I, I'll, I'll take your word on that. Well, we've also gotten a, f- a couple of messages through Twitter. In fact, one is from a name that our listeners may recognize, Zach Davison, who is the translator of many manga titles, including the Kataro volumes that we discussed last month. And he tweeted out, excellent podcast, and not just because they talk about me. <laughs> so... <laughs> So that was great to hear. And then also we got a tweet from Geo Sip, who responded about last month's episode. Great book. My only complaint is that the reproductions are too small. And he's referring to the Gravit book here. It would be greatly benefit. It could have greatly benefited from being printed in a larger format. And I mean, I see where Geo Sip is going is coming from here and saying that the Mangasia book would have looked even better in kind of a larger expanded coffee table size text. Um, but from what it, you know, with what it was, I, I really liked the book. I thought it was well done. Beautiful reproductions. Um, 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I thought the the book, uh, the reproductions in the book were terrific. But you know, I am a sucker for uh, for coffee table books. So if um, Thames and Hudson decides to uh, to put out a, a larger format, you know, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> And then finally, we got an email from a longtime listener, Paul Spence, and he tells us, Hi, Derek. It was great that we had a double shot of the manga show twice in the month of January. What Paul's referring to is our February show came out that very first part of January, and then we got the January show at the end of January. The discussion of Mangasia was an eye-opening look at the world of manga outside of Japan. I wonder if you would consider looking at the book Manga Poverty, written by manga creator Shuho Saito. It is an insider's look at the economics of the manga industry from the perspective of a creator. The book is only 99 pages, and it is a quick read. It may fall outside the purview of the review show because it isn't a work of manga. But, you know, then again, Shay, you and I discussed Gravit's Mangasia, which is something like that, right? So it's a book about manga as opposed to an actual work of manga. So who knows? Maybe in a future episode we can take Paul Spence up on his recommendation and discuss Sato's manga poverty. Yeah, I'm always eager to learn more about the workings of the manga industry. Uh, so that seems like something that would be right up my alley. Mm. And we want to thank not only Paul, but everyone who corresponds with us and who reaches out via what Twitter, email, YouTube, or any, any, any way that you want to contact us. We love hearing back from you. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, Shay, you want to get into February's reading? Yes, I am very excited to get into February's reading. And we're going to start with a creator that we discussed last time. I guess it was not quite two years ago. Seiichi Hayashi. And this time around, we're going to be discussing Red Colored Elegy, the softcover edition. And this came out last week, in fact. Uh, mm -hmm. From Drawn in Quarterly. Now, the hardcover edition of Red Colored Elegy was released from Drawn in Quarterly in 2008. And it's taken them quite a while, I guess 10 years now, but uh, we do have now a softcover edition. And I, I'm, I'm curious, I never did um, contact the publicity department at Drawn in Quarterly to ask this, but I wonder what took so long to get the softcover edition out. Um, my understanding is that it just, uh, fell out of print for a number of years. Um, and, uh, if, if I had to guess, uh, I, I think Ryan Holmberg had a lot to do with getting this, uh, new edition released because this new edition does include, um, like all of the other manga titles, many of which we've discussed on the show, uh, that are edited by Holmberg include this very, very nice contextualizing essay, um, that uh, provides a lot of background for the work and the work's um, influence and legacy. And um, so uh, I, I think that might have had a lot to do with it because, uh, yeah, I'd been, I'd been hoping for a reprint of, um, of this book in, in any form for, for quite some time. And yeah, I, I, I don't know. So it's just a matter of getting it back into print, you're saying? Um. Yeah, but I, I do think, um, you know, Holmberg was involved in this edition, and he I don't believe he was in the, the earlier edition, so mm -hmm. I can't say for sure, but it seems to me like that may have played a role, um, because he's been instrumental in getting many, many of these alternative manga titles, uh, specifically works by uh, contributors to Garo magazine in the 60s and 70s, getting their work either um, back into print, um, after a long period uh, or um, getting it into print for the very first time. Um, so that's, that's, uh, I'm inclined to believe that that, that had something to do with it, but 
I can't say with any certainty. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Garo. We should, um, I guess, contextualize this discussion by saying that what we have now as red-colored elegy was originally serialized in Ghetto between 1970 and 1971. And then I think, what was it, in 72 it was published in book form? Um, in yes, Japan. I believe that's correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you have the original Drawn and Quarterly hardcover edition of this book? Uh, I do not. It, like you said, it came out in 2008, and um, it's been out of print pretty much since then. And uh, that was a little before my uh, my time in terms of my interest in um, in alternative manga, and uh, specifically the, the kind of manga that Hayashi does, which is kind of very opaque and elliptical and, and very um, aesthetically kind of odd. So um, I was reading comics at the time, but it, it's not a, a title that ever would have um, caught my attention when it was easily available. Right. Well, the reason I ask is because I did get the hardcover edition of Red Colored Trilogy mm. when it came out. So I had read it previously to us preparing for this month's manga episode. And when I saw that Drawing Quarterly was going to come out with a soft cover edition, I was wondering, do, do I – do I even need the soft cover edition? Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that the publisher sent one to me automatically because with the soft cover edition, as you mentioned, you have that really nice extended mm-hmm. essay yeah. by Ryan Holmberg, which is not in the original 2008 release from Drawn and Quarterly. So I think for that essay alone, even if you had the hardcover edition, it's worth getting this new soft mm-hmm. cover edition that Drawn and Quarterly just released last week. And the great thing about Holmberg's essay is, you know, as you pointed out, it does place Red Colored Elegy and Hayashi in a broader sense within some kind of cultural and, I I guess, manga context in the way that he approaches this essay or the subject matter is he talks about Red Colored Elegy as a narrative of romance – He also talks about how the title tells us something about the animation industry at the time, also about how manga creators aspire as artists while at the same time making a buck because they they need to make a living Mm -hmm. by getting involved Mm -hmm. in, let's say, things like the animation industry and whatnot. He also talks quite a bit about the – or writes about the influence and impact of Red Colored Elegy, and then Mm -hmm. the fact how Red Colored Elegy has become now part of this intermedia phenomena, I guess, over the past several decades, where you have films that have been inspired by the manga – and then other works that have been inspired by the film, and then music, and how in some ways you can read Red Colored Elegy as kind of a a meta-commentary in one way or another on the, I guess, the fact that different media are participating in a particular story and making it something much more than just simple manga. Yeah, um, it's a... It's a really fascinating work because, like, um, like I think Holmberg does a good job of of um, explicating and uh, interrogating in that that essay is uh, red color elegies is in many ways this kind of phenomena, right? It, it is in in many ways very influential. Um, it's a kind of cornerstone work for a lot of um, other works, a lot of other cartoonists. And it's a monumental work of alternative manga. Um, and yet, in, in the United States, it's, it's a work that you know very, very, very few people have ever heard of, let alone have read. Um, you know, so, so there is this... It's just, it's just fascinating how in, some, in certain spheres, it's, it can have such, such prominence, and, and others, uh, it's, it's kind of pushed off to the periphery, to the extreme periphery in some cases. Yeah. You know, speaking about the cultural impact of Red Colored Elegy and, uh, I guess, the intermedia mixture that Holmberg is discussing in his essay, um, this book inspired a song by, I I guess he's a a folk singer in Japan or was a folk singer in Japan, Morio Agata. 
and his song, and I, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, uh, Sekishoku Ereji. Is that how you pronounce it? But anyway, it, it, it's a song that uh, basically spawned from Red Colored Elegy. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Hayashi's always had this kind of weird relationship, this like kind of give and take with with music. I mean, you just mentioned that Red Color Elegy inspired songs, but then an earlier work of I believe it's an earlier work of Hayashi's um, called Flowering Harbor is also itself inspired by um, uh, by music, and so there is this kind of uh, I think there's a there's a lyricism. Um, that's apparent in Hayashi's work, but it, it is kind of feeding off of music and then also kind of uh, offering itself up to music in this, this interesting way that I think is, is really unusual for, um, for a comic book. Mm-hmm. Well, we've been talking around Red Colored Elegy, you know, its impact, its context, and, and what have you. But let's really get into the text itself now. Um, so if you were going to describe Red Colored Elegy to someone who had never read it, how would you do so? <sighs> that is tough, because like a lot of Hayashi's, this is actually Hayashi's longest sustained work. Um, and like m- many of his other smaller works, there is a kind of obfuscation of um of plot or of story there's this emphasis on on mood and atmosphere and feeling and emotion and um so i think that the clearest way i can describe this plot of red color elegy is to say that it is about these two young lovers who are cohabitating and dealing with Stress from parents, stress from work, um, expectations and responsibilities, and um, just examining how those kind of stresses and those pressures affect them as individuals, and then them as their relate, and then them as a as a couple. But then there are scenes that are that are he represents that in a in a way that is not uh, naturalistic or, or literal. It's it's very kind of um, expressionistic, right? Because there are a variety of scenes throughout this book that seems out of sync with what's going on in terms of, you know, the events that are occurring, you know, what's happening on, on the plot level um, where I, I think there's one scene where there are a couple of pages with a car chase and then a car wreck. Now, is that actually happening at that moment? No. And it seems kind of out of place. But if you see that as a kind of metaphoric or or at least an abstract representation or an expressionistic representation of what the characters are going through, what they're feeling or how they're interacting, then it does make sense. But if you didn't know that going in, you may be confused on your initial reading of Red Colored Elegy. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the first page, I believe, is a if I'm remembering correctly, it's a th- it's three or four long, wide panels organized vertically that feature. Um, I believe it's Ichiro is the is the man in the relationship, right? Um, it, it's I believe it's Ichiro walking across a plane. There's no background, and it's him and another figure who's decapitated, and there's like squirts of blood coming out of the neck um, yeah it looks like a cartoon they're having a conversation right it looks kind of like it, it's a very like stylized almost disney-ish styled um cartoon figure who's who's missing a head and blood is just kind of like squirting out of the neck and they're they're conversing and that's like the first page or two of this book um so it's it's i, I think you can you can reduce red color elegy to this very very simple um plot you know it's this happens, this happens, and this happens. It's it's very simple. It's very easy to comprehend if described in a certain way. Mm-hmm. But reading it, uh, Hayashi draws those scenes and draws that interiority and those the psychological lives of uh, of those characters and represents those things visually in such a way that it can become very confusing and, and difficult to to parse. But um, as as a huge huge Hayashi fan, I think this is um, precisely the the appeal of his work. 
Right. Uh, now, you mentioned the couple. Uh, you know, the man's name is Ichido, and his girlfriend or the significant other that he's uh, living with is Sachiko. And both of them are artists or artist figures. Now, Ichido is working in animation, and he has kind of a love-hate relationship with it. He doesn't really want to do it, um, but it is paying some bills, and it does allow him to be creative. And in fact, you know, getting back to those opening pages that you referenced, you know, that's probably the reason why that friend of his who looks like a Disney-esque character, you know, albeit decapitated with blood coming from the neck, um, looks more like animation because, as we soon learn, Ichido is working in animation. Mm -hmm. And his girlfriend, Sachiko, seems to have, at least on the surface, a little more satisfying job as an artist. But one of the things that I think complicates her situation and the relationship she has with Ichido is that, at least from what I can gather, she seems to be drawn in certain ways for an artist that she works with, uh, someone who is, I guess, her supervisor, who is the master, I guess. And she's working in his studio. And there's something between the two of them that is brewing, it seems to be, underneath the surface and potentially risking uh, Sachiko's relationship with Achido. Um, but I don't know if we ever see that come to fruition, that relationship between Sachiko and her coworker. Um, but Achido himself is also tempted into other directions away from Sachiko. Now, much of the action does take place, you know, I guess, so to speak, in the bedroom, right? In, in the same place where Achido and Sachiko cohabitate. And we see them conversing, we see them making love, we see them getting along, we see them debating their relationship or their individual lives or what's going on with their families. Because as you pointed out, each of them is having a problem with family in one form or another, you know, with the parents and siblings. And so we do see the two of them interacting together within their room or within their, you know, the space that they cohabit. But we also see both of them sometimes together, many times by themselves or with other people, um, trying to deal with other things outside of the house. And in fact, uh, you know, there, there are occasions where Ichido is absent and Sachiko is wondering where he is. And so it mm -hmm. is a relationship, but it's one that seems to be fraught with quite a bit of tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And I think that the tension there is um, is really the crux of the the narrative. It, it is, you know, in my reading, it's a it's a this exploration of um, this tension between um, between lovers who are who are not quite able to um, enclose in, in, in a certain way and, and, and fully know their partner. There's, there's always that element of, of mystery. And, you know, when you're home alone and you don't quite know what they're doing, especially if they don't tell you or you're suspicious about something, and especially in the, the days before cell phones where we could keep in constant communication, there, there was that that mystery that that uh, is a uh, is fertilizer for um, this tension, and I I think the book is really about exploring that tension, representing that tension, where that tension comes from in this um, this really really aesthetically interesting way. One thing that helps to set Red Colored Elegy and its style into some kind of context is a point that not only Ryan Holmberg makes in his essay, but if you do a little research into criticisms surrounding Red Colored Elegy, you will see this referenced again and again and again. And that is the fact that Red Colored Elegy came out at a time where – 
at least in, in, in Japan and, you know, in, in the States as well, you know, there was quite a heavy influence of the French New Wave cinema, right? So Hayashi was influenced by, uh, you know, some of the works like that, like Godard, in fact. Um, and Red Colored Elegy has that same kind of feel. So if you watch a Godard film, you do notice the kind of disjointedness, the number of jump cuts in terms of the edits and whatnot. And it's not the easiest narrative to follow. One of the films from Godard that I'm very familiar with is Breathless, which also deals with the relationship. So I couldn't help but think of that as I was reading Red Colored Elegy, because it does have a similar... I guess feel where there is a lack of clear linearity, but mm-hmm. if you kind of pull back and look at the narrative as a whole, it does tend to make sense, but mm-hmm. in a non-traditional way. Yeah, I, I, I know. Um, I think it was Holmberg who mentions that he was influenced by um, by the French New Wave, but I, I was. Um, I, I think elements of Hayashi's go uh, of of his aesthetic go beyond what Godard is doing, and I was really put in mind of the Japanese New Wave, which um, specifically one of my all-time favorite filmmakers, this guy named Seijin Suzuki, um, who made a couple of his fam- he's most famous for movies like Branded to Kill um, or Tokyo Drifter, which are these weird movies that, um, they're like genre movies that feature these incredibly bizarre set pieces, these um, you know, Brandon Kill is in black and white, but Tokyo Drifter features these incredibly garish and loud colors. Um, you know, the emphasis is on uh, the movement of bodies. It's on um, uh, uh, it's on color. It's on sound. It's on um, the rhythm of 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 editing. It's um, it's it's this strange, almost ar- an anarchic kind of kind of film that. Um, that I was really put in mind with when I was thinking of um, of Hayashi, but I do think that Hayashi retains, um, you know, a certain fidelity to um, to narrative to story like Godard, where I, I think Suzuki uh, is 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 far less interested than than Godard. Um, but um, yeah, so Hayashi is is definitely drawing on these kind of global uh, avant garde um, film movements to create this thing that is, like you said, in some ways very easy to understand, very simple, and in other ways it's kind of like alienating and and uncomfortable, and, and you're not really quite sure how to interpret it or what to make of it, um, or even to un- to think if it's like. Is this good? Is he doing this on purpose? There's a there's a amateurish to, amateurishness to Suzuki's work, but it's a very it's a thoughtful, almost refined sort of amateurishness that he's kind of deploying these these things that seem amateurish or we've been trained to understand as amateurish in very intentional ways. I want to go back to something you said a moment ago, and I think that kind of feeds into what you were talking about in terms of the at least apparent amateurism that goes into the storytelling of Red Colored Elegy. You said that, you know, it is a narrative that when you think about it does make sense. And I couldn't help but think of the previous book that you and I discussed not quite two years ago from Hayashi, uh, the collection of stories Red Red Rock. Uh, This came out from Breakdown Press. And, you know, as we discussed on that episode, uh, Hayashi in the various stories in Red Red Rock isn't the most coherent and linear of storytellers. And yes, even though Red Colored Elegy is kind of disjointed, or at least it has this appearance of being disjointed, but as you point out, it's in, more intentionally so than than otherwise, Um it does follow more traditional narrative conventions than the variety of stories in Red Red Rock. I mean, I couldn't help mm-hmm. but think of how confused I was, but in a good way, with the various pieces in Red Red Rock. But with Red Colored Elegy, it was easier to follow. And again, yes, there are those, I guess, comics equivalent of uh, disjointedness, jump cuts and whatnot. Uh, really rough edits if you want to look at it that way and make another comparison to to New Wave film. 
Um, but there is a story that's being told here. You can discern a story. Um, yeah, certainly. And, and like I mentioned at the top of, um, of the show, uh, this is – I am uh, I'm about 99.9% certain. I'm not some overlooking some some work of his. Um this is Hayashi's longest sustained narrative um by far. Mm. And um you know I've read Red Red Rock and I've read I've read I, I think at this point I've read all of the works of his that have been translated in English and um Gold Pollen and other stories yeah, that's another Pollen and Quarterly collection. Um yeah, Gold Pollen and other stories, um Red Red Rock, Flowering Harbor um uh I believe that's it and um and then this and uh all of those like you said are 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 compilations there of shorter works and so those shorter works are uh much stranger and I I I think that is primarily because they are um it's a different form from the 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 longer red color elegy which kind of requires a at least some sort of of sustained narrative through line to carry Hayashi through um the the entirety of the work and and I don't think um the the shorter works are bound are quite bound by that constraint they can uh it's easier for them to get away with something that is very quick immediate um very strange it doesn't have to sustain itself for 100 150 pages or so um the way that that red color elegy does um you know that's to say i i I absolutely agree with you that i think this is a um narratively a much more coherent work than his than his uh the other works of his that i've i've read um but i i do think that is a, a product of the difference in in form you know like that like those are are short stories but this is a a novel shall we say right exactly with the with the short stories they can as you put it get away with what they're doing because their impact to a large degree is much more impressionistic Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um as opposed to this longer form narrative red colored elegy which purports to tell a story so there has to be a little more coherency in there i mean i guess you could have a novel length work like this that is completely 100 percent disjointed uh, that would, though, require a more sustained sense of confusion on the part of the reader. Uh, but, but I think that the, the way that Red Colored Elegy differs from some of those other stories that we've discussed from Hayashi uh, is that, yeah, there are going to be those confusing, at least first time you read it, moments on uh, the surface, at least, of, of Red Colored Elegy. Um, but really, there is something being told there, and this is a serious story about a relationship of two people who are similar in a ver- variety of ways, but in other ways aren't connected as a, at least we'd like to think that they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is um, – I mean, I, I, I think that Hayashi's whole body of work is very much uh, a piece with – the other works of um, Gekiga or other works by the by Garo contributors that we've talked about the show, you know, people like um, Masahiko Matsumoto, Yashihiro Tatsumi, um, Tadeo Suge, um, their work all, I mean, even um, Shigeru Mizuki, um, their work is um, serious and much of it addresses very serious i think what we would call very literary concerns um these these concerns of uh, psychological interiority the relationships between people things like ennui um uh you know uh, uh the depredations of of poverty um these things and i think hayashi's whole over is is very much a part of that um but i think red color elegy is the the clearest example of the ways in which he is concerned with relationships and the tension in relationships and uh, the way relationships kind of function or fall apart, um, the way partners in relationships respond to, to stresses. Um, I think that's that's present in many ways in, in his other works, but like we've talked about, they are concealed under this very uh, opaque uh, avant-garde aesthetic that it, it, it's 
it's it's difficult to to parse that out in in some of those shorter works in in ways that it's it's not quite so difficult here. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And one of the things it just dawned on me, uh, we neglected to mention the translator of Red Colored Allergy, and that is Tyro Nettleton. So I know we've talked about Hayashi on the show before, um, but uh, before we move on to uh, uh, our second book this month, uh, did you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about Hayashi's art in this book? Um, I mean, where's there were there particular things he was doing here that that really caught your attention that you wanted to talk about? Well, you know, we, we've talked about a little bit of that with the opening pages that you've referenced, right? The the almost cartoony, Disney-esque mm-hmm. style in the opening mm-hmm. panels, which I think was intentional, given mm-hmm. the fact that Ichido is in animation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the style throughout most of Red Colored Elegy, especially when it comes to our protagonists, Ichiro and Sachiko, are, I don't know, I would describe as relatively straightforward, simple, almost two-dimensional, and the two-dimensionality of their representation in the art becomes even more apparent when Hayachi gives us other characters, for instance, family members, Mm -hmm. Um, and we see them in a more complex, visually speaking, manner. In that there's more shading with them, there's more detailed in their facial features. Many times we see other characters in, in, in close up. And I don't know if there's an occasion where we see either Achiro or Sachiko in close up. We see them for the most part from kind of a medium or medium long shot, right? Where we can mm-hmm. see, if not their entire body, or what you would call that in film, we see them like either their entire bodies or at least most of them from the torso or from the waist up. And, but with other characters, every now and again, we get, you know, full on facial close ups. And that's where I think a lot of the detail comes into play and in, in the shading and whatnot. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I was, I was, I was wondering I was, as I was rereading this, why do we see our protagonists as more two dimensional with less detail as opposed to some of the other characters? And I think in some ways, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, um, that Hayashi is choosing not to illustrate his protagonists in too detailed a manner because to some degree, Their experience, I don't want to say it's like an every man's or every person's experience, right? That all people who are in relationships go through, you know, similar complications and whatnot. I mean, they do have a unique relationship, but I think that we as readers are supposed to empathize with them, maybe see some of ourselves and what they're going through, but not necessarily. In other words, the lack of great detail in the representation or the illustration of Mm -hmm. these characters says something about their openness in terms of how we interpret them and what they're going through. Mm-hmm. That's interesting that you kind of read it as a as an openness. I you know, I'm I'm actually in the middle of reading a bunch of uh, Emmanuel Levinas for a project I'm working on um because I'm in grad school and that's what you do, you read these obscure <laughs> philosophers and um and so I'm really taken with the idea of 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 the other as a kind of unknowable subject. And so when I was reading this, I was thinking of it as, as a way of Hayashi representing the kind of limits of knowability when it comes to um, another person, right? There's only so much you can, you can uh, know about um, a subject. And I, I thought the kind of lack of detail or um, intermittent detail um, that he provides, he the, you know, the two main characters was, a, I, I, I thought, a, a good representation of the way that there are kind of, that even in a relationship, these two people live together. You know, they are in some ways so physically close to one another, but there are still um, bounds to how uh, far their knowledge of one another can go. Right, and it, it's it's like we can't really understand or know these characters in any depth, mm-hmm. and 
you know, as you were just talking, I was thumbing back through the narrative, and I noticed that more times than not, when we see figurations of either Sachiko or Ichiro, it's in profile. Even in those occasions where we probably should be seeing them askew or a little tilted, um, we nonetheless see them as, you know, we would see them from the side. And so even in that basic way of illustrating these characters, there is a simplicity there that we can't see all of them. We only see their outline. It's almost like we have just a silhouette to go by. Yeah, and that's that's one of the the things for me that is so um, that just attracts me so much to the work of Hayashi is his kind of aesthetic sensibilities. You know, there are various panels in in this book, especially. Um, you know, I'm thinking of one panel. It's a it's a very simple image of a hand holding a cigarette, but you see images uh, similar to this in in other works of his that are rendered with such fine detail. You know, he is demonstrating for us that he has the capability to draw this comic with uh, incredible fidelity to to naturalism or to realism. Um, But he makes the choice to to mix and match and juxtapose all of these different kinds and styles of figuration against one another in the same panel or to figure the same character differently across multiple panels. Um... And there is, there's something ideological almost about how he's playing with, or maybe maybe it's that he's he's considering the the ideological dimension of a particular aesthetic and, and playing them against one another for a for a particular effect. Yeah, and in fact, I just found that page or the particular panel of the hand holding the cigarette that you had referenced, and that's on page 220 of this new edition. And you're right, that is quite significantly more detailed than most of the other art that's surrounding it, you know, that either comes right before or right after. And there are a variety of instances like that throughout this text where you have highly detailed art in the middle of something that, by contrast, looks quite stripped down and simple. Well, Shay, you want to move on to the second title that we're discussing for this month? Uh, yeah, as much as I would love to talk about Red Color Elegy all day, every day, uh, <laughs> we can't do that to our listeners, so let's uh, let's move on to, uh, to the next one. Yeah, and this is quite a different text. Uh, it is written by Keu Sh- uh, Shirai and has art by Pasuka Demizu, and this is The Promised Neverland. And we're discussing Volume 1, which came out in December of last year. Now, in early February, Volume 2 of The Promised Neverland was released, although you and I do not have a copy of that. Yes, so we um, are not able to uh, talk about that one. Exactly. And you and I were able to get our hands on this first volume of The Promised Neverland, and we had contacted Viz Media who in the past has been really good in terms of making sure that we have, if not a physical copy, then at least a digital copy to prepare. But they must be really busy because after multiple emails, they never got back to us. And so we were left with only this first volume. And we should also say that we had planned on pairing Red Colored Elegy with another rather experimental work of manga, but we didn't get those copies in the mail in time. And so The Promised Neverland was kind of a fallback title. But even as a fallback, it's not as complete as we had wanted it to be. We we're only discussing this first volume. Yes, but fortunately, I think uh, 
I think there's enough in this first volume that we'll have uh, plenty of interesting things to talk about. Yeah, I- exactly. Uh, this is uh, being published by Viz Media. It's part of their Shonen Jump series, and in fact, it's currently being serialized in Shonen Jump. And I guess had either of us or both of us had uh, digital subscriptions to Shonen Jump, we could be up to date in our discussion of The Promised Neverland, but neither of us do. Um, And like I said, this first volume was published in December, so just a couple of months ago, and the story is by Keiu Shirai, and the art is by Posuka Demizu, and this is translated by Setsuki Yamashita. You know, I I feel that on this episode, I'm doing a lousy job of (laughs) pronouncing the the creator's names. I'm trying. Um, (laughs) Yes. Yeah, th- yeah. This is quite different from Red Colored Elegy um, in a variety of different ways. <laughs> whereas Red Colored Elegy was a much more experimental work and didn't play by the rules, so to speak. The Promised Neverland fits within certain genre expectations, and it just makes sense that something like this is currently being published in Shonen Jump. Um, it's the it's the story of three kids, Emma, Norman, and Ray, all of whom are orphans, and they and a number of others reside at a place called Grace Fieldhouse, and they seem to have a really great existence, right? They have mm-hmm. a warm place to stay, it's secure, great food, uh, clean clothes, everything about this orphanage, at least at first, seems to be perfect. But then Emma and Norman notice that something a little untoward happens. Uh, One of the younger orphans by the name of Connie uh, apparently has found a foster home. She hasn't been adopted yet, but there's a foster home that she's apparently going to. And they notice that a toy that Connie absolutely loves, a stuffed rabbit, was left by Connie, and so they run to catch up with her and to give her her stuffed animal. What they find instead, and and this is not a spoiler in any way, um, because you learn this relatively early on, but what they discover is that Connie has actually been killed. And they overhear some, at first they don't know exactly who's telling them this, but they overhear some demons talking about the orphans at Greenfield House and how they are, so to speak, being harvested for the consumption of these demons. And so Emma, Norman, and then later on they bring their friend Ray into the know, realize that what they thought of as a privileged, comfortable existence actually has a much darker side to it that they even realized. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a bit of a weird book. (laughs) Um, you know, I, uh, I'd like to get your, your take on this. Actually, I was, you know, because when I started reading the book, I, I had never heard of it. I didn't know anything about it. So, after reading this first volume, I tried to read a little bit about it, and I had seen a couple people comparing it to um, Death Note, particularly the way that um, the kind of central conflict in both series is played out um, as a kind of as a kind of battle of wits, shall we say? It's it's about uh, the protagonists outwitting or outmaneuvering or outgaming the antagonists. Um, and I know you're currently in the middle of reading Death Note, and so I was curious if you, if you saw a similarity in, 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 in that way at all. Oh, actually, it's funny you mentioned me currently reading Death Note. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I finally finished that series. Mm. Um, and, you know, I have to say that I liked Death Note – a lot more toward the beginning than I did at the end. I really do mm-hmm. think that the narrative played itself out and was kind of spinning its wheels for the last several volumes and was going in a direction that, on the one hand, seemed a little too predictable and pat. Uh, on the other hand, went in places that I didn't necessarily appreciate like I did, um, let's say, the, the the series where it started off. 
I didn't think about Death Note as I was reading The Promised Neverland, but I can see where you're coming from. Um, you know, both narratives deal with demons or demon-like figures in one form or another. Uh, and that there definitely is some kind of game of wits, at least from what we see in this first volume, going on between our protagonists, Emma, Norman, and Ray. And the main antagonist right now, who goes by the name of Mom, or what the kids, who the kids call Mom. Now, you know, I mentioned earlier that Emma, Norman, and Ray's existence at the Greenfield house seems to be idyllic. The same can be said for their relationship with the woman who oversees all of the orphans at the Greenfield house, someone that they call mom. And in fact, Emma even points out that, yeah, all the kids who stay there, who live there are orphans, but she really does feel that the orphanage is her home, that the other kids are her siblings, and that this older woman, and I think she's in her 30s, um, that they call mom is like a mother. But when they realize that they, as orphans, are being harvested in in various ways for the consumption of demons, what they assume to be the case once they overhear some demons talking, then they suspect mom of being in collaboration with the demons. And so automatically they no longer trust her. And there seems something much more dark and sinister going on with mom. Now, along with this, because you were asking me, if I saw this kind of game of wits as working, at least in this first volume, I think it did to a point. I don't want to say that it lost me toward the end of this first volume. It's just it took a different direction that not only did I not anticipate, but also I don't know if it's the best direction for it to go. What I mean by this is, the narrative up until, let's say, the last fifth of this first mm-hmm. volume uh, was primarily focalized through our protagonists, you know, Emma, Norman, and mm-hmm. Ray, mm-hmm. Uh, or even some of just the other kids, right, who play minor roles and supporting roles. Um, when toward the very end of this first volume, we have a shift in focalization from the kids to either mom or another caretaker who's introduced at the very end, a woman by the name of Crone. Is it Crone or Crony? Um, I bl- I was reading it as Crone. Yeah, it's K-R-O-N-E. And we do get things from their perspective, sometimes even interior monologues in, in the mm-hmm. case with Crone. And I asked myself when I saw those parts, is this the most successful way of setting up this dynamic, this tension between the kids and then the caretakers who seem to be in collusion with the demons? I think, it, you know, for you know, uh, armchair quarterbacking here in terms of this narrative, is that the mystery surrounding Mom and Crone would have been greatly enhanced if we only had information focalized through Emma, Ray, and Norman, and we didn't get access to what Mom and then Crone were thinking and even doing. But I think Mm -hmm. seeing things from the caretaker's perspective watered down the mystery for me. Mm -hmm. No, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things that um, that I wanted to make sure that we hit on. I I, I think, um, like you mentioned, the it, it appears as though the kind of um, point of view for the reader is going to be that of the children so that we um, don't have access to anything that they don't have access to. Right. And um, I really enjoyed that for uh, a good long time because it, it did keep up the mystery and you weren't really sure whether this character was good or bad. In what ways were they good or bad? What were they plotting? What were they doing? Um, there was a... a an, uh, I think an effective element of mystery there in that um, that choice to to make that our, our point of view, um, and like you, I thought you know shifting that a little bit, and it's not even that they they that um, you know the point of view is is split between the kids on the one hand and the adults or the demons on the other, and we're shifting. It really is just a couple moments where we get. Um, like you said, there's a scene with with um, with Crone where we get interior monologue where she takes over the narration, um, and so there's just a couple scenes like that 
that really, really feel out of place because they're, you know, it, it's not as though the design is that we move from one to the other and back again. We, we alternate. It, they, they are kind of these anomalous scenes in many ways. And uh, like you, I felt that they did kind of detract from the, the mystery a little bit. I think they, they, they um, offer readers a little bit more information about the kind of um, the, the machinations and the makeup of this, this world outside of, of this um, orphanage. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you that it did kind of um, denude the, the mystery. It made it slightly less compelling in, in some ways. Right. And, you know, I went back through and I've pinpointed, I think, the scene that I felt that this was, at least for me as a reader, first disruptive. And this is around, I guess it starts on page 165 of this first volume of The Promised Neverland. And this is when Mom, and I I guess her name is what, Isabella, uh, and then Crone are alone and discussing the situation. And this is when the mom figure mentions to Crone what she suspects, although doesn't absolutely know for certain yet, about the kids finding out about the demons and that they're being harvested. And so in certain ways, it's in this, what, several-page scene that she seems to be plotting with Crone. And it was at this point that I thought, okay, now you've kind of spoiled the mystery because I liked, at least as a reader, not being entirely sure if Emma and her friends were spot on in their assumption that mom was in collusion with the demons because it would have been nice if there was a little more complica- uh, some more complications going on between mom and the demons. And there may be. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. we've only read mm-hmm. this first volume. Who knows? Maybe in the second volume, which just recently came out, there's even more complication with the character of Mom, the character of Crone, and how they interact or what's expected of them by the demons. Um, it's just that I think they tip their hand a little too quickly in this first volume by giving us access to Mom and Crone. Um, yeah, I agree. It's 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 not. They're not. Um elements i'm i would have i would necessarily opposed to uh to including um in in fact i think they're elements that that have a lot of uh promise for uh, for stories as the 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 series continues but i i I do think like you said they they tip their hand a little too early and um i don't think that um those particular moments were the ideal uh places to, to kind of reveal that information or um or maybe not, maybe it was just the not the the best way to the best way to reveal that information. Yeah. Now, okay, let me play the devil's advocate to the position that you and I had just been taking, <laughs> um, because we learn almost at the tail end of this first volume that there are some ulterior motives surrounding Chrome. Crone and her relationship with Isabella or the mom figure. In other words, Crone, and and again, I don't think this is any kind of spoiler. Crone seems to be ambitious on her own Mm -hmm. and appears to be plotting to use the situation, not only to make sure that the demons get the kids, but that mom is out of the picture, right? And then Crone could eventually take mom's place as head of Greenfield house, and so there's something quite conniving about Crone. I don't know if that information would have worked if earlier we had not had access to the plotting and the perspective of the mom figure and then Crone. Um, so to that end, I can see why Sarai, as the writer, had given us that access to mom in her perspective, instead of having everything focalized through the kids. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I don't. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that because um, I, I think in many ways that um, that scene where we do get uh, a fairly good amount of like interiority of Crone as a character and really hints at um, future developments for the series. I thought that was. Um, a kind of good scene to conclude this first volume with because it is 
um, it opens space for um, for future stories. It immediately complicates the world of uh, the story, and um, it makes Crone um, a more fully realized character. Um, so I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I'm just trying to think that that maybe there was just a better way to kind of reveal that information, and so you could um, just have a, a a stronger balance of the two. So you could um, reveal that information and really propel the plot forward in the same uh, direction without sacrificing the uh, the kind of um, point of view conceit that you had established up until that point. Right, because, you know, the way that they represent the character of Crone, I liked the hints at what she might be instead of coming out at the very end and revealing who, you know, she probably is, uh, you know, this conniving individual. What I mean by that is that when we're first introduced to Crone, she seems to be someone who has some ulterior motive, but at first we don't know if that's the case. And this comes through really nicely by her smirks. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are several times where we get something like a close-up of Crone, and we see the word smirk as a sound effect. (laughs) And so, and, and I thought that that was really a nice way of teasing there may or may not be something a little conniving about the character of Crone. But in the very end, when we do get access to her, her, you know, interior thoughts about how she wants to use this situation to actually, you know, take mom's place. Again, that, that seemed to me a little too much. That's more telling than showing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that is, I think, uh, that is a common problem in maybe some of these like B or C level kind of shonen manga that you know demonstrate a lot of promise. They've got a lot going for them. They are in many ways very compelling, but there are these little bits that are just they just overplay their hand just a little bit, and it really prevents them from. Uh, from hitting that kind of like the highest kind of peak of that, of that genre or that form. Um, And I I think what you're talking about is an example of that, where if they had just, uh, just reined it in a little bit or kind of like uh, just played that scene in a slightly different way, it would be a little bit stronger. Yeah. You know, you had, called, in essence, The Promised Neverland, or at least this first volume of that series, kind of a B or C level manga, um, maybe I'm giving them a little bit, too, the creators, a little bit too much um, credit here, but the difference between what you and I are seeing as potentially problematic with The Promised Neverland may be the result of the audience expectation that Hirai and Demizu or writing under. In other words, let's contrast this with the text that we were earlier discussing, Red Colored Elegy. I mean, obviously, Hayashi is not writing for a younger audience. Whereas Sirai and Demuzi, Dem- I'm sorry, Demizu are writing for a younger audience. And so, I mean, you know, for no other reason, you know, this is appearing in Shonen Jump. Uh, and in mm-hmm. a serial format. So it's something that we're, okay, we may not be as comfortable with these kind of disclosures, right? Or what we've been describing in one form or another is kind of weaknesses of narrative. They may be necessary for younger readers or less sophisticated readers. I, I don't know. I, I don't know which is a better way of saying this, but, um, And I don't want to suggest that they're writing down for a younger audience. It's just they're writing with a younger audience in mind. And so they probably need to be less ambiguous in terms of character ambitions and whatnot. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's absolutely a fair point to make. And, um, you know, uh, particularly in um, the realm of of shonen, especially mainstream shonen um, manga, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, edit- editors have so, so, so much control about um, 
where stories go and what individual um, uh, chapters uh, look like, you know, because they are thinking of like, well, we need to include this. And so you can carry it on. You know, they are uh, they are very invested in um, in kind of lacing stories with uh, seeds for years of future of potential years of future stories. Um, so I, I think the idea that um, that this book that the prop that the quote unquote problems that we are having um, with the book or the things that we that don't totally work for us. Uh, I think there's an, there's a, a, a very strong possibility that you are right and that they are the product of, um, of the authors and editorial, uh, including those things or doing those in such a way for very specific purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is, especially in, in this, um, market is is definitely something that is a factor and that we uh we should be wise to consider now one question that we always ask each other especially when we have the first one or two volumes of what seems to be a kind of a longer ongoing series is is this a title that you're going to keep up with so let me ask you shay is the promise neverland a series that you're going to return to um, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I think there were, like we talked about, there were elements of the narrative that didn't totally work for me. And then there are just elements of um, this genre. You know, it, it is in um, many central ways a, a, a fantasy s- story. And um, often I just don't have a lot of interest in that. So there are certainly things about the book that either I think weren't executed as strongly as they could have been or through no fault of the authors just don't tend not to work on me. But there are elements of it that I think were really accomplished and interesting and and compelling and effective. And I think the premise itself is uh, um, fairly interesting and, and fairly compelling. So I don't I have to think about it a little bit more, um, but I, 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 I'm thinking I'm in, I would be inclined to at least give it a, a couple more volumes and and really determine where it's going before I made a decision. Um, if only because I think the art by um, by Pasuka Demizu, who we've who we've mentioned a number of times, is is terrific. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, their art is, um, you know, there are there are little moments and little details that feel very kind of um, homogenous. They feel like ways of drawing this or that that I've seen a hundred other times. And then there are other panels that I think are just really striking and really like cool. And I, I think it's in many ways the um, a very, very good example of the kind of art I like to see in um, a shonen manga. Um, so I, I'm thinking that I... I, I don't want to commit myself to to keeping up with it, but I I would be interested in checking out at least a couple more volumes before before making a decision like that. Um, but but what about you? Yeah, I'm of the same mind. I I really enjoyed the premise, and I think that there's a lot of promise there. Whether I will continue with it, I don't know. It's it. I wouldn't. Okay, I wouldn't not continue because I don't like the series. If I don't continue with it, even with the best intention, it's because of a lack of time. You know, there, mm-hmm. there are a lot of other things, especially manga, that I feel like I need to either introduce myself to or to keep up with. And am I going to have time for future volumes of The Promised Neverland? I hope so, because I'd like to see where this thing goes. Um, mm-hmm. but, but I don't know. So I guess my ultimate answer to you is it all depends if, you know, <laughs> if, if I have the time availability to do so. One other thing, though, that we never mentioned, but I want us to at least briefly discuss this before we wrap up our discussion of Promised Neverland, is the fact that on all of the orphans are numbers. In other words, tattooed on their neck Mm -hmm. are these numbers. And it's interesting because when we're first introduced to everyone at Grace Fieldhouse – it's described as, as we mentioned, kind of an idyllic situation. 
you know, food, shelter, comfort, mm-hmm. family, all of these positive things. Yet, as Emma points out, everyone, all of the kids there have numbers tattooed on their necks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's just something sinister from the get-go, right? I don't care mm-hmm. how nice a situation these kids seem to have. The fact that numbers are tattooed on their necks tells you mm-hmm. something ain't right. And, yeah. you know, there, there's something concentration camp-ish about that. And I, I was curious what you thought about that kind of overt visual cue as mm. to, you know, the tattoo that something's not right there. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, like you, I saw that and, and immediately my, my thought was, um, I think to, to most people who are going to see, you know, in a work of fiction, um, numbers tattooed on people i think like many uh readers it's my first thought is is gonna be to the holocaust which is a very serious <laughs> very serious historical moment and um to say the least to say the least <laughs> um and so i think that when i saw that i wasn't really sure what was going on um but yeah, I think that's a pretty clear and a pretty immediate indication that something is not right here. There is something nefarious going on under the surface. And this character may not be aware of it. This character and and the other characters in the the story may not um they they may not read the fact that that the children are numbered like that as an indication that something isn't quite right. Um, but I do think it's a it's a pretty early and a pretty explicit giveaway to readers that some that that the kind of niceties and the appearance of of um, um, of comfort and um, camaraderie that we see uh, the characters experiencing we get we get a sense that that is an illusion that is very soon going to be kind of uh, undone for us. Right. Because, you know, on the one hand, it does seem really ridiculous that these kids aren't in the least a bit suspicious at first, that they mm-hmm. have numbers tattooed on their necks. On the other hand, and I don't think this is something that we pointed out in our discussion of Promise Neverland, the kids are really cut off from the outside world. Um the place where they live, Greenfield House, I guess property-wise, it, it seems rather large. There's enough space for them to play both inside and out. However, there are certain points that they can't transgress. So, for instance, there's a main gate, and they're not supposed to go to the main gate. There is a fence surrounding what seems to be the outer edges of the forest, which surrounds the house. And they play in the forest, but they can't cross over the fence. And so they're cut off from the outside world. And in fact, we as readers don't even know by the end of this first volume if there is an outside world that is similar to the one that we would recognize. Now, you said that this is um, genre-wise something like a fantasy. It's almost like a futuristic fantasy because we learn mm-hmm. at one point that this is taking place about 30 years from now. Mm-hmm. And so I'd be curious to see if I if I read on in future volumes, if there is something about the world that has changed um, for the over the past 30 years for our characters and how their world may be vastly different from ours, where maybe it's populated and ruled by demons. What happened? Mm-hmm. No, that is absolutely something that kind of immediately caught my attention. This uh, I immediately began wondering, like, what is the world like outside of this gate? What does it look like? How does it operate? Um, you know, geographically, politically, uh, what resources do they have? My mind started asking all of these questions because, you know, it is it is so obviously, so intentionally, and so kind of monumentally withheld from the characters and from the readers. Um, and there's this implication that the world of the story functions so differently from ours that I, I, I you know, like you, I, I did, I was like, I really would like to see kind of what that's like, you know, what does a city in this world look like? What does commerce in this world look like? Um, and so, um, 
uh, hopefully they kind of explore that in future uh, future volumes and we get an opportunity to, to see. Mm-hmm. Well, Shay, two very different books that we looked at this month. We started off with Seiichi Hayashi's Red Colored Elegy, the recently published softcover edition from Drawn and Quarterly. And then after that, we looked at the first volume of The Promised Neverland, written by Keiu Shirai and with art by Pozuka Demizu. And this came out from Viz Media. So an interesting combination. Yeah, and... Uh Two very different books, but um, two very interesting books. That's right. And if you want to find great manga like the kind that Shay and I discuss every single month, then definitely check out the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to dcbservice.com, you will find great prices on a variety of manga titles. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your manga there, get in touch with us and let us know what you thought about our discussion of Red Colored Elegy in the first volume of The Promised Neverland. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up the phone and dialing 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also send us some electronic mail. We love receiving emails. Uh, you can email the show at two guys at comicsalternative.com. You can email me directly at shay at comicsalternative.com. And Derek, what is your email address? Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us all over social media, such as on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, and... And we have both a Slack and a Discord channel, so get in touch with us that way. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we occasionally post on the blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com and we do like to receive messages from you so definitely get in touch with us whether it be through youtube or email or twitter or facebook or what have you shay and i love the correspondence yes we love to learn and it helps us keep up with the incredible number of manga titles that no human being no single human being can keep up with by themselves. That's right. Although we try to, you know, as as much of an uphill <laughs> fight as that is. And we will continue that fight next month. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Shay. Take care. Oh, shit.
ていられたら」